all of you around the world who are joining us for this incredible and historic campaign. Uh, you have an opportunity, an amazing opportunity to join with thousands of other people who have already, at the beginning of this incredible Amudim campaign, have brought the number to over $3 million. Over $3 million or a $5 million goal has already been achieved. We are encouraging everybody around the world at some point in the next few hours, but I say at some point in the next few minutes, go to the website, igivewithheart.com. IGiveWithHeart.com and join this amazing effort and keep Amudim going and going strong. This is the Mendy Klein Legacy I Give With Heart 2018 campaign. All through this broadcast, you will hear how meaningful the Amudim organization was to Mr. Mendy Klein of blessed memory. And everybody out there, if we band together and each give a little bit or a lot to this campaign, we can keep his legacy going strong and his love for Amudim will live on forever. Uh, fittingly enough, our first guest on this historic broadcast is Rip Tzvi Glug. He is the executive director of Amudim. He is the one who founded this organization and uh, he is uh, very grateful so far to the worldwide Jewish community who has gotten us to over $3 million in this wonderful campaign. He and I would love to see us get to the $5 million goal as soon as possible, and maybe we'll even exceed that. Speak luck. Welcome to the show. Welcome. It's a pleasure to see you again. I appreciate that. This is uh, an organization, frankly, that years ago, I don't know if the Jewish community needed. Certainly, I don't know if they needed it at the level that it's operating at now. Uh, at what point did you and other community leaders, including the late Ben Klein, say it's time to found, it's time to form an Amudim organization and really address some of the very serious things happening to Jewish youth in this world? So I'll be honest, I'm not sure if that's an accurate statement that it wasn't needed. I think it was more of an accurate statement that it wasn't realized that it was needed. Because sadly, a lot of the people that we're dealing with today, believe it or not, are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, who could have used this help many, many years ago. Uh, but what really happened was, is I had met uh, Lindy Klein through Mushy Wolfson after a grandson's bris, and uh, we got into the topic of conversation. And we uh, went home to Cleveland that night and called an emergency meeting for all the uh, Rabbanim in Cleveland to discuss this uh, issue to see whether or not this was a real problem. And they sort of laughed at him saying this is a huge issue. And uh, over the next few months uh, we developed a great relationship. At which point uh, he sent me a text message one day saying, please come urgently to the Prime Grill for an important cloud meeting. So I dropped everything and I went to that meeting. And that meeting had uh, about 13 of the biggest players of the who's who in the film world there. And when I showed up, um, they basically said, uh, what are you doing here? And I said, I don't know, many people might not ask me to come. And about a minute later, Tzvi Hoon walked in. And uh, turns out that Mendy Klein had texted me by accident. And he had called Tzvi Bloom about 10 minutes later saying, where are you? And Tzvi goes, what do you mean where am I? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. And uh, Mendy already knew by the time I got there that there was a mistake. But he didn't want to make me feel bad. So he said to the whole cover there, listen, I need Tzvi here to share with you what's really going on in the world. And through that reverse episode of Kamtza Bar Kamtza, we were able to get a serious discussion with serious players, which then followed up by a breakfast uh, that Shlema Wardiver had in his uh, home for Chush. Mendy then pulled a bunch of the big hitters down to the basement and said, we need to have this emergency meeting right now to discuss the problems of Kla Yisrael. That affectionately became known as the basement meeting of Shlema Wardiger. And that was actually the beginning of Amut. How long ago did all this take place? Uh, the end of 2013, we formed our official paperwork in May of 2014 and actually opened our office since July 1st, 2014. Well, relatively speaking, that's not a, 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 a large amount of time, and yet in that time, according to the statistics in front of me, you've been able to uh, serve almost 5,000 people. You've been able to open up offices all around the world, including major ones in major cities in the U.S. and Israel. And the estimate of the calls that your staff has fielded just in the last 18 months 
is over 150,000. So to say the need was there is an understatement. Well, absolutely. It's kind of interesting because I made a comment to Rebellion Hartney about how sad it is the Rav Hamudan that we have so many calls and so many cases. And he said to me, what do you mean it's sad? It's amazing. That means people have a place to call. So uh, it's a bittersweet number. But, you know, we've serviced about 4,921 people since we started. And we have offices in Israel, in New York, in Cleveland, in Miami, and in Muncie. Um, and we deal with cases all around the world, not just necessarily in the New York or Boston. A lot of people tonight are going to be talking to us about these different cases and about different situations that the community needs to know about. Uh, the figure is already at 3.1 million and growing as we try to get to a $5 million goal. Uh, it's obvious that people around the world understand the importance of this. Uh, I, I need you to remind them why it's important that everybody participate. So it's really important because having 23 employees, offices, locations, overhead expenses, I mean, this campaign is being broken up into the three different categories. Of the $5 million, $1.5 million is going towards the operating budget of Amudim USA. Right. Uh, 600,000 is going towards the operating budget of Amudim in Israel. 400,000 is going towards the budget of the GOPS program, which is the at-risk youth program, uh, summer camp and Israel trips. Uh, 1.5 million is being raised for the Project Heal Therapy Subsidy Fund, that's for victims of abuse who cannot afford to pay for therapy. And uh, 1 million dollars is actually a new initiative where we are working in conjunction with a few other organizations to develop a full curriculum for 5th through 12th grade boys and girls in a culturally sensitive fashion of emotional well-being to try to address these issues long before they actually happen. A lot of grassroots efforts, to say the least, and a lot of emergency efforts. Things that we'll hear about tonight where young people are in very, very serious situations and need to be addressed immediately, and of course you and your staff. She came to Ari's funeral on Sunday afternoon to help. As soon as Ari's Brooklyn funeral concluded, Svi took Yisrael to Manhattan to get a new passport. There was a tight window to get this done as our flight to Israel was only a few hours later. Blank passports are kept in a safe. As fate would have it, officials had trouble opening the safe. After a few attempts, the safe automatically locked for about an hour. I kept in close contact with Svi, and he kept on saying it does not look good, but we will try our best. They finally got the safe open, but it still takes time to print the passport initially. Finally, with a fresh passport in hand, Svi personally rushed Israel to JFK. As it was very close to the flight, Svi had the LL security manager waiting for Israel to rush him through security. Thankfully, Yisrael made the flight and was able to accompany and bury Ari. Uh, I did bring Yisrael's passport. Do you a comment about growing up and seeing your father get involved in everything for everybody? You want me to be honest? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I think until I was about 19 years old, I promised myself to never get into public service. <laughs> After seeing all that, huh? Uh, if you really want to know. <laughs> until uh, it got to the point that I realized, uh, you know what, this is important, and uh, we have to do it. But the truth is, it wasn't just my father. My mother also bar Hashem. Been very involved in Chesed. And uh, it really uh, it paved the way for me. You know. Let me say this straight, it was a lot easier for me to be able to get things done being Rabbi Gluck's son, not to mention being able to get out of a lot of trouble doing things when I was a teenager being Rabbi Gluck's son. That's a separate discussion, but by the time we wanted to open up the doors, uh, being my father's son certainly moved into my to say with people, but certainly I see the Shereb is sort of a very serious abuse case. I couldn't get in the door, my father made a phone call, next thing you know, the door's open, he's there with me, addressing the issues. Um, you know, and this has happened time and time again. So, you know, seeing the family of Chesed and having the Teresa's regal to be able to get into places through my father has certainly helped me in the path that I'm on right now. Rabbi Gluck, Amudim helps individuals. In turn, as you know, helps families. Entire families are changed because of their work. And I would argue, as I'm sure you would, that it really helps uh, help save the community. It helps on a larger scale turn around things in the community at large. Speak about that for a moment. Basically, you have people that need help. They're either ashamed to go for help, embarrassed, they're either too lazy to get up and look for some assistance, 
So what happened is an organization like a Muslim came and said, here is what we can do for you. We're not asking what you can do for us, but what we can do for you. And Hashem gave my son the cycle to be a person who's not looking for COVID and separate He's looking, what can I do for you? Basically, that is what Bnei will need now. We have to pray that Mashiach should come. He didn't come two days ago. On, on, on Tishba, on left, on Tishba, I was very disappointed. But now we have to take from him this thing. What can I do for you? And basically, that's a success for Mudim. And that should be a success for the Oil of Buhab to be able to do for the Jewish people. Thank you very much, Rabbi Block. You should continue to have the strength to continue to do great things for the Jewish people. Takes on a hundred dollars, this is 52 years ago, puts it on the table, he says, this will help you more than anything else. So I'm going to repeat what the Sapna was there. Anybody who wants to help Bnei Yisrael, and with basically, to get on the right throw, on the right thread, and to work together with everybody else, that must depart, or support with some of their money, so that they can help a very, very important thing as we are doing now. Basically, don't be ashamed. You can, whatever you give, the more you give, don't be embarrassed. It's too much. Just keep on giving, and Hashem will help you, and He will pay you back. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you both very, very much. You've heard Rabbi Gluck. You've heard Rabbi Gluck. You've heard what they've said. We uh, we see that we're over 3.2 million dollars. Uh, everybody knows at this point that the goal is five million and to get there as soon as possible. We'd like everybody to please give what you can. Every single donation is multiplied by four, which means when you give a $25 donation, you're giving the same $100 that Rabbi Gluck just alluded to. When you give $100, it's really $400. But you need to get to the website if you're not there already. I give with heart.com. I give with heart.com. But I found this poem uh, about describing the mask that we wear. I felt that it was very apropos. This person writes, the mask that we wear. The Oxford Dictionary defines mask as one, a covering all or part of the face or the disguise. Some masks are frivolity and fun. Think Mardi Gras for one. But for a universe of others, masks are worn as prosthetics for survival, not charming fermentations for celebrations. Carefully crafted in coverings and sense of shame, the disguise is hiding. But if there's one thing that I can tell you, that I want to tell all the listeners and everybody that's here tonight, is that don't carry their shame. It's not your shame that you're carrying, it's their shame. You didn't ask this to happen to you. And I understand what that means because I've walked around with that fear for many, many years. This was something that I brought up to myself. And I know that when I was seven years old, I didn't ask me be abducted off the street and taken up to a rooftop. I didn't ask to be indoctrinated into the rules of sexual abuse. And for the next several years, repeatedly, by various rebellions, counselors, choir leaders. I didn't ask for that. But for years I felt like I was the cause. It was the common denominator between all of them was me. Close to 35 years ago, pretty much at this time of the year, kind of late August, mid to late August, I had suffered a drug overdose, and it was an individual that literally picked me up off the street and vowed to help. He saved my life. And not to take anything away from what he did, but he gave me a choice. Once I was able to recognize the 
presented me with a choice in life. And that choice was, you can go on, you can leave that sacred for the rest of your life. And everybody will pity you. And nobody will ever be able to point the finger and say that you're bad, you're, that you're good for nothing. Because of the crimes that have been perpetrated upon myself. But if you want to make something of yourself, and you want to give people, if you want to show people that they can do something, the first thing you should do is that you need to straighten yourself out and you need to make something of yourself. Baruch Hashem, I can say, I've been married for 30 years. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. And most important is I'm no longer a victim. I'm no longer a survivor. I'm alive. And these are the things that didn't just happen overnight. It took a tremendous amount of health help from close friends that I felt close enough to be able to talk to them about it. Therapy. These are all the things when you have choices that are made down in front of you. And nobody's going to fault you if you can't make the right choice. Because years ago, the choice to go down the hall of sexual abuse was not your choice. Somebody made that for you. But now as an adult, you can make that choice. And believe me, the day that you take off your mask, the day that you're prepared to take off your mask, you cannot imagine what kind of a relief that is. One of my biggest regrets talking now is not having an organization like it up here when I was young. My parents had to go at it alone. They didn't have the resources for the organizations that were out there. As I mentioned earlier, this was a taboo subject, right? This was something that nobody ever told about. But today, we have awareness. We have organizations like the Union that are out there that are trying to do everything that they can to help the people out there. Take advantage. Take advantage of this and give selflessly of himself to help others. Take advantage of an organization like the Union that's out there to help you. Their, their sole purpose is to help you. Don't be burdened by their shame. Remove your mask and allow them to help you. I feel like I need to applaud you. You just uh, spoke to Nachum Siegel uh, live on the ear. Um, how do you feel um, the community is reacting now compared to years ago? Uh, very simply, it's not being swept under the rug as much. There are still, unfortunately, isolated pockets of that happening. In fact, quite a bit, but I know the work that Tinkla and the Wonder are doing is really raising that awareness. But, I mean, it's just a, a huge, tremendous difference. A tremendous difference to think that in the Trump community there would be such a public event where no one's pulling punches. We're talking about addiction, we're talking about sexual abuse, we're talking about rape, we're talking about all these things. Ten years ago, this I don't think this would have been a possibility, especially when I was going through these experiences. So, it's a tremendous difference. When it was first occurring to me, I did not believe that this could happen to anyone else. How could anyone be this rule? How could anyone else suffer? When I first started talking about it, and it's only in the last three, four years, I've kept this a secret for 20 plus years. I was just astounded by, like you said, by the breadth of who this happens to, men, women, Hasidisha communities, Litvisha communities, Hashivisha communities, Orthodox communities, Zionist communities, 
all you know communities of Judaism, and it's and in a way it makes me feel that what happened to me is not as bad. But it also tells me that this problem is a lot bigger. And again, the work that Steve Clark and I'm with the do is just my work. They say it was. We've spoken tonight about things that we don't usually um, speak publicly about in forums like these. Uh, and I'm going to take advantage of your experience by asking you the following on a night like tonight. You have seen children, and people can you know, imagine what age group that is, teenagers, 20s, etc. Uh, you've seen children be buried. You've seen them lose their lives, whether it was their own decision, whether it was uh, a direction they went in that became very dangerous. And if I would ask you, and if you would say the number of people that you've had to bury from circumstances like this, it would be shocking to everybody who's tuned in. When people give to your organization, they are literally saving lives. They are literally helping you not go to bury people, but help to get them started on the road back to a quality life in our community. So, I have to say that, you know, in the early days I used to get into trouble when I spoke about numbers. Because people asked, what are you speaking about numbers for? What are you trying to gain? <clears throat> Unfortunately, tonight itself you had someone here who buried the daughter. Since January 1st of 2016, we started keeping count. Under the age of 35, we have lost 384 souls. 384 people that will never have another day to live. And that's a real one. I could tell you on the flip side, we service close to 4,291 that are still doing very well. So we have to uh, say that. You want that number to increase. Absolutely. You want it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh. 